Hello and welcome to another episode of Supernatural Scotland. I'm your host, Mark Smith. Scotland is an ancient land with so many terrifying and haunting stories. Scotland has been inhabited since around 12,000 BC, so as you can imagine, it still holds some secrets in this world of technology. And with so many years of adventurous souls. So join me as I discuss more stories from Scotland. Our first location is Melrose Abbey. The abbey lies northeast of the centre of Melrose Town. In 1136, Melrose Abbey was founded after a request from King David I. This beautiful abbey took 10 years to build and over the years was extended. As discussed in the last episode with Dryborough Abbey, it was also damaged on a few occasions during conflicts between Scotland and England. The abbey was mostly damaged by the army of King Edward II in 1322, when they attacked the town of Melrose and in 1385 by the army of King Richard II. It was later damaged in the time of Mary Queen of Scots and after all the damage it was never to recover and was not fully repaired. The last monk died in 1590. It is also claimed that the Scottish wizard Michael Scott who wrote about dark magic, the occult, astrology and alchemy was laid to rest here. A stone coffin was found in 1812 in an isle which is thought to be Michael Scott's resting place. But this has not been proven. It is also claimed that Michael Scott haunts the grounds of the abbey due to being laid to rest here in this peaceful setting. Some believe his magical books are buried in Melrose somewhere. The more famous event in regards to the Abbey is its very own vampire story. It is claimed a vampire roamed the ruins in the blackness of night. The vampire left a dark shadow over the village for many years, with people scared to go out in the dark. It was thought the vampire of Melrose was a chaplain to a lady who lived nearby. He was quite the sinner in his time and was nicknamed, excuse me if I don't quite pronounce this right, Hundepriest, meaning dog priest. He was given this nickname due to his love of hunting on horseback while a pack of hounds followed. When he died, it is believed, due to being such a sinner, his soul could not rest or find peace and he was cursed to be a vampire feeding on blood to survive. The terrified town reached out to the church for help and the monks would answer this cry for help. The elder monk was summoned to exorcise this evil and he brought along another monk and two men. As per their beliefs they prayed and fasted ready to fight this hellish monster. They then set to the task and began investigating. They had heard the stories of the Hindu priest and so decided to keep an eye on his grave. Soon it was the dark of night and no daylight could be seen. The other monk and two men left to warm themselves in a nearby house, possibly not believing anything would happen, when all of a sudden the vampire floated out of the deep grave moving the gravestone with ease. The vampire approached the terrified elder monk very quickly ready for his latest meal. 
the monk escaped in order to calm himself, ready to do battle with the demon. He had nowhere to hide and so knew he must continue. The vampire rushed him again, but this time the monk struck him with an axe he was wielding. The wound was deep and the creature retreated this time. The monk completed his exorcism and the vampire had no choice but to retreat to his grave which closed again. The other men then returned and the monk filled them in on the terrors he had encountered. They then dug up the cursed corpse and removed it from the grave when dawn arrived. They found the deep wound which the elder had caused. It had bled a lot of blood which should be impossible for a normal corpse, but alas this was no normal corpse. They carried the body out of the monastery and they burned it. They then spread the ashes and that was the end of this evil fiend once and for all. Our next location is Inverary Castle, which is a large country house near Inverary in the county of Argyll. It is near the shores of Loch Finn, which is the longest sea loch. It has been occupied by the Dukes of Argyll or chiefs of Clan Campbell since the 18th century. The castle has a gothic style to it, which adds to how cool it looks. This castle was built in the 1700s and replaced an earlier castle from the 15th century. Originally the roof was flat but later a third floor was created with a pitched roof and dormer windows. In the 1770s the village of Inverary was destroyed and rebuilt a short distance away to make the castle more secluded. In 1975, a fire damaged the castle and the Duke with his family lived in the basement while restorations were carried out. Its claim to fame is being used during the filming of the 2012 Christmas episode of Downtown Abbey. It portrayed the fictional Donegal Castle. The Campbell clan could have been from Game of Thrones with their careful diplomacy over the centuries. The chief of the Campbells had risen through the ranks to become Errol, Marquis and finally Duke of Argyll. They were often involved in political disputes and most of the time won those disputes, benefiting them incredibly. In the 17th century, the Marquis of Argyll found himself in dispute with the Marquis of Montrose during a Scottish Civil War. In 1644, Montrose and his army invaded Campbell territory and went straight for Inverary. The Campbells at this time had a tower in the area. The Campbells had to flee the castle, leaving the castle servants by themselves. One of them was an Irish boy who had been employed as a personal harp player. The invaders broke into the castle and ransacked it. They discovered the harpist. Unfortunately, the army did have a large amount of Irish fighters and they were furious with the boy for working for the Campbells. The poor boy was dismembered and left lying out on his master's bed. The Campbells eventually took back the castle but due to the tragic and terrible death of the harpist, he never left. Haunting harp melodies could be heard coming from the room that the boy was murdered in. When the newer castle was built in the 18th century, the bed was also moved into the new castle. They believed since the boy had been put to rest and moving into a new castle, this would stop the haunting and allow them to forget the terrible history of the tower. They 
were wrong. The ghost came along with the bed and continues to haunt the newer castle. It is said there is a feeling of dread in the room and furniture can sometimes move on its own. The harpist is not aggressive and often shuffles the library or has been spotted playing with the books. To this day you can still hear the faint harp music echoing the halls of Inverary Castle. A physician in 1758 with two other men witnessed a battle in the sky and others have witnessed it since. The battle appears to take place between Highland and French soldiers. The Highlanders appear to retreat after attacking a French held fort and they leave other dead Highlanders behind. It was then discovered that a battle had taken place abroad and that a Highland regiment was included in a British force of 15,000 men and the army had lost 1,994 men and of those 300 Highland soldiers were lost from the Black Watch Regiment whilst attacking a French held fort in Canada. The tales from Inferiore only get stranger. A ghost ship has been seen from time to time near Loch Finn. It is a ghostly galleon with three men visible and is said to have the Campbell's coat of arms. Witnesses have seen it float along the Loch Finn and sometimes to the shore before disappearing. When the ship is seen, it's said to foretell the death of the chief of Clan Campbell. One chief in the 18th century had seen the ship, but then he tragically died of poisoning. And finally, it has his very own Grey Lady, who can be seen haunting the castle, and it is claimed that this ghost was killed by a Jacobite soldier, probably during the Civil War and invasion. It certainly sounds like there are many strange sights to behold at Inverary. And now it is time for the Legends of Scotland. Our first legend comes from Calanese, Lewis and the Outer Hebrides. They say a white fair cow came to save starving islanders by giving milk at the Calanese where the stones are around 5,000 years old. The strange creature had red ears and emerged from the sea as a desperate woman tried to drown herself due to being so exhausted and knowing the end was near for her people. She heard a soft and musical voice which commanded her to return home and get a milk pail. She was also told to tell her neighbours to do the same and they should go to the stones of Callanish. A pail full of milk was provided every night to all the people until one visitor got greedy and tried to get two pails. The woman turned out to be a witch and had one pail fitted with a sieve to the bottom of the bucket. She milked the cow dry and the cow left for the fairy kingdom again. After much research, it has been confirmed the stones were built in this way to align with the orbits of the sun and the moon. Very mysterious indeed. Our second legend is of the blue men of Minch. These are sometimes known as storm kelpies. They are mythological creatures which live in a stretch of war between the northern Outer Hebrides and mainland Scotland. They spend their time looking for sailors to drown and stricken boats to sink. They are specifically located in this area 
in Scotland only. They are indeed blue and look like humans as well as being around the same size as us. They have the power to create storms. They often spend calm days floating in the water asleep near the surface and with their blue colour they are hard to spot. They are said to swim with their torso out of the sea. They can also speak and have been known to approach ships so the chief among them can shout out two lines of poetry challenging the captain of the ship to finish the poem. If they cannot finish the poem then the blue men of mentioned capsize the ship. Some believe the blue men are fallen angels split into three. The first being fairies, the second being the blue men, and the rest being merry dancers of the Northern Lights. I hope you have enjoyed this week's tales and locations. I always enjoy finding juicy stories to tell you. It's now coming to the time of year for camping. If you do happen to camp out, why not play one of my episodes for your friends when the sun goes down and you have a fire to keep you warm. And on that note, it is the end of this week's podcast. Goodbye.